Hello, everyone. I'm told you've been here 13 hours, um, so I'll try to keep this brief. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I will say uh, a lot has changed in my life in the last two years, and namely, I got to be White House press secretary for probably, certainly, the greatest president in my lifetime, President Donald J. Trump. But since I left my job as press secretary, even more has changed, namely the questions being asked by the White House press corps. I don't know if you watch the briefings. If you don't, don't bother. I, I watch some of them on your behalf so that you don't have to. And I brought for you some of the questions that were asked of former press secretary Jen Psaki. Um, it's Friday. It's not Saturday. This is not Saturday Night Live. But here we go. Could you just, this was her first briefing, could you just give for us some color about what it was like for Joe Biden to walk into the Oval Office? He's been waiting for this for so long. What was his reaction? I would have loved a question like that. Never came, <laughs> never came. And there was this, will Joe Biden keep Donald Trump's Air Force One color scheme change? Hard hitting question there. Can you clarify for us what happened with the president's dogs? There's some reports that one of them was involved in a biting incident. Great. And then my personal favorite, can you tell us about the White House cat? These are the questions. Now, flashback, here is some of what I was asked from the podium. Let me ask if I can, Kaylee, why does the president keep hiring people who are dumb as a rock, overrated, way over their heads, wacko and incompetent? So you've used the phrase warriors to describe everyday Americans fighting the pandemic. The president's using that phrase as well. What's the thinking behind that description? And is he bas basically asking Americans to put themselves in harm's way, harm's way like warriors do? No, I think he's just praising the American people fighting through a once in a generation global pandemic, but okay. And then there's the question, and I went back and watched this, and you can see me flipping through my binder and I just kind of stop and I stare because this is the question I was asked. Does President Trump believe that it was a good thing that the South lost the Civil War? <laughs> they say there's no such thing as a dumb question, but yes, that is a dumb question. But rewind to before I got to the podium, um, how I got there, it, it was pretty surreal. I will say it came out of the blue. Um, it was COVID-19, I was the press secretary at the time for the Trump campaign. I had been with my mom who's watching right now on the East Coast, that's real commitment to watch at midnight on the, on the East Coast. Uh, but she's wonderful, she took me and my daughter, baby Blake, all across the country, all the places you think you'd go in a primary, you know, South Carolina, Iowa, everywhere, New Hampshire, and then all of a sudden there's lockdown, so everyone shuts down. Florida is a great place to lock down. You got to lock down on the beach. And we're driving across this bridge one day. I'll never forget it. My mom's in the front seat. My daughter, Blake's in the back seat. She's a few months old at the time. And I get this call. And what pops up is this odd series of numbers. And I knew I'd had a few calls from the White House, not many, but I knew it was likely the White House switchboard and likely it was the president. So I answer and they say, Kaylee, we have the president for you. Will you take this call? Of course I will. Um, Kaylee, Mr. President, and this time, instead of President Trump saying, good job on that TV appearance or nice work on this article, he said, I have a question for you, and I said, what's that? He said, would you be my White House press secretary? Out of the blue. I said, that would be the honor of my lifetime, to which he said something like, Mark, get it done, and I think he meant Mark Meadows, go get it done. And Mark Meadows did get it done. It took a few weeks, but he got it done. And I say it was surreal because I had been an intern in the Bush White House, I had remembered standing in the back corner of the room watching Dana Perino take questions from the press, not knowing that I would be there just over a decade later. And I grew nervous after I took the job. My husband, he drove me up the Eastern Corridor. I didn't want to get on a plane. I thought if the press saw me on the plane, they'd say, new press secretary on a plane during COVID, putting the president's you know, life at risk or some bizarre headline like that. So my husband drives me up and my dad texted me as I was very nervous, very jittery, and he said, Kaylee, maybe you were made for such a time as this. Um, thank you, yeah. <laughs> An obvious reference to the book of Esther. Uh, and it's funny, I feel like sometimes when God wants to send you a message, he will send the exact same message 
through two unlikely sources, and he did this time. He beat me over the head with this message because it was my dad who's about as conservative as you get, and then it was someone about as liberal as you get, liberal commentator Van Jones, who texted me a few weeks later, Kaylee, maybe you were made for such a time as this. And I believe it's a message I was certainly meant to hear, and it's a message that is meant for all of us, uh, no matter where we are in life. My first day was April 13th, 2020. Again, we'll never forget it. I, I round the corner. I had to walk the perimeter of the White House through the pouring rain. I get to the press secretary's office very early. I was like the first one there outside of Secret Service, sopping wet because it's raining outside. And you know, I'm sitting there not knowing what the first day will bring. And a little ways into the day, I get a call from the chief of staff to come to the Oval Office. I had never been to the Oval Office. I had seen it from outside back when I was an intern, but I'd never been inside. And the first time I'm walking into the Oval Office is to brief the President of the United States before a coronavirus task force briefing. Um, and I walk past this mahogany grandfather clock. I walk onto the sunbeam pattern rug. It was a rug from the Reagan administration. I sit on this golden couch, and it's across from the Resolute Desk. It was a gift given by Queen Victoria in 1880 to the United States. And I sit there, and the president walks in. And as a press secretary, to be a good press secretary, you're briefing your boss. You have to adapt to his style. So I had to learn. How does the president operate? How does he get ready for a briefing? And I learned very quickly, he didn't really practice the Q&A. He didn't say, you know, what am I going to be asked today? Um, he focused a lot on his opening remarks. It was a binder like this with slip covers, and he would have his opening remarks in there. And he'd read through it, and he would take out a Sharpie, and he'd cross out parts he didn't like. Uh, he would rip off parts he didn't like. One time I saw him take scissors and cut off parts he did not like. So he was a very self-sufficient guy. Instead of telling his staff, go fix this, he would just do it himself. Um, and I learned quickly, I'm not going to have time to brief him. I thought, you know, maybe I'm going to get a chance to tell him about one question or one news item. So he's walking out to the podium, and, and I say, Mr. President, I know what you're going to be asked today. He said, what's that? And I said, well, Dr. Fauci, of course, went on CNN, um, made a mess, suggested, had a, a messy remark saying that we could have mitigated sooner. The press is spinning it out of control, saying that we could have saved more lives had you mitigated sooner during the COVID era. And he said, well, how would you answer that, Kaylee? And I was a religious watcher of these briefings that he would do and the medical professionals. And I said, here's how I'd answer it. Uh, I would say this, Mr. President. I said, January 6, not a single confirmed COVID-19 case. You issued a travel notice for Wuhan. January 17th, not a single COVID case. You had public health entry screenings at three major airports. January 21st, just one case of COVID. You open an emergency operations center. And January 31st, who can forget it? There was not a single death from COVID-19. You issued a travel ban for China that your opponent, Joe Biden, called xenophobic. He looked at me and goes, go type that up. So I run back to my office, I type it up, I give it to him, and the president, if you notice, President Trump is a little more with it and in command than the current president. <laughs> he didn't, yeah, and that's understatement of the year. He did not need a, a list of exactly which reporters to call in, in which order. He did not need a scripted answer for me to read. But that day, and that day alone, I believe, is the only time I saw him read through a timeline that I had written tick by tick, point by point. And I thought, day one in the White House, accomplished, until I realized I think he only did that to make me happy because it was my first day and he wanted to make me feel welcome. But nevertheless, he did. <laughs> I wondered, though, if I would ever give a briefing. Uh, the president was giving these daily briefings, and I just thought, OK, maybe I'm, I'm not going to get that opportunity. Fine. You know, he does a great job being his own messenger. And then one day, he looked at me out of the blue a few weeks into the job and goes, Kaylee, do a briefing. I think to myself, OK, this is Wednesday. I need to give myself like two weeks to get a binder together. And then he kept saying, Kaylee, do a briefing. Kaylee, do a briefing. I'm like, OK, he's saying this a lot. Like, maybe I need to hurry this along. And then on Thursday, he says, Kaylee, do a briefing and do it before the weekend. Oh, OK. So that means tomorrow. So we try to get a binder together. And the binder became something of interest to the press. They had a camera behind me. And they would take pictures of my binder. And they would write articles like CNN, decoding the mysteries of Kaylee McEnany's briefing book. And they tried to figure out what all the tabs meant. 
Uh, we thought we would do a head fake one day, and instead of like therapeutics, vaccine, COVID, PPE, we would do Jim Acosta as a tab, and Caitlin Collins, and John Carl, the reporter names. Uh, never did it. It is a big regret, but we never did it. But I get this binder together. I get ready. I stay in my office. We have this beautiful wood-burning fireplace in the press secretary's office. I stay there till about 10 with my aides prepping. Uh, I, go, I go home. I prep until about midnight. So I'm ready from an academic standpoint. But more important than that was the spiritual preparation. And I woke up the next morning, day of my first briefing. I listened to a Joyce Meyer sermon about faith over fear. I tweeted out Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I listen to Christian music on my way to work. I get there though, the day progresses, I know I'm briefing at, I believe it's 2 p.m. and I start to get nervous and more nervous. And I have text messages flooding in, people giving me words of encouragement, one of whom was my predecessor, Sarah Sanders. And she tested me pieces of advice. I know she'll be here tomorrow. I'm, I'm so excited. I, I love her so much. And among the pieces of advice she gave me was this. Most importantly, pray. Let God carry you through the tough times, give you strength when you don't have any wisdom. And then she said to me that she read her Jesus Calling devotional every time before she went to the podium. And she sent me her Jesus Calling devotional from exactly two years prior to the day of my first briefing, which was May 1st, 2020. And it said this, you are on the path of my choosing. There is no randomness about your life. As you give yourself more and more to a life of constant communion with me, you will find that you simply have no time to worry. But I worried, I worried a lot that day. To the point of being at, in tears in my office and my assistant comes in, Lindy, and says, you can't be in tears, like you need to be at the podium right now. She gets my parents on speakerphone. I, I talk to them, I go to the, we pray together. I go to the private West Wing bathroom, I get on my knees, I say a prayer, I go back, I see the President of the United States, I see Jared Kushner, Mark Meadows, the Vice President, the Vice President looked at me, motioned towards me with praying hands, said he'd been praying for me. And I went to the podium, and no one would know it, but I was in tears in my office to having this absolute, total, and complete serenity standing there, as if I had been standing there my entire life. So I will tell you, those of you who prayed for the administration, and I know it's a lot of you, thank you, because I felt your prayers. We all felt your prayers. Thank you very much. But I will say, I, I've answered a lot of questions, and now being on the media side of things, I gotta tell you, I have a lot of questions. Namely, what is going on at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue on literally every single issue? I mean, you look at COVID-19, and this is a president who said he was going to shut down the virus. That was his vow. And specifically, he said this, anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States of America, referring to President Trump. More Americans have perished from COVID-19 on Joe Biden's watch than on President Trump's. And last time I checked, he's still sitting in the Oval Office despite his vow. Look at the economy. I watched that press conference at the beginning of the year, uh, the press conference that came just as this war was about to break out in Ukraine and Russia, the minor incursion comment, which was such a disaster. The president opened his press conference by talking about the enormous progress we've made on the economy. He wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed this week, the first third of which was praising how great he has done on the economy. Last time I checked, we have inflation, a supply chain crisis, a worker shortage, not to mention baby formula. Who would have thought that in a Western country, in the United States of, Amer of America, you would go to the grocery store, to which I went just a few days ago, and find no formula on the shelves. That is where we are, as the President of the United States praises himself. And as CNN, even CNN writes, Biden's economic ratings are worse than Carter's. When CNN says that, you know you've got an issue. Look at the border, the southern border. There were two million encounters on the southern border last year. And make no mistake, these are not all innocuous encounters. There were five Syrian men who were caught on the southern border. There were 157 encounters with people on the terror watch list. The FBI director tells Congress it's a heck of a challenge from a security perspective, you think? It certainly is a heck of a challenge. 
And when Republicans take over the Congress, this needs to be investigation either number one, two, or three, because what has happened on our southern border is a travesty. You look at foreign policy in Afghanistan, that is a great scar on the moral conscience of this country. Uh, the fact that the Taliban, they were called our partners, our partners, that's how they were described. We used to have a phrase in this country, leave no man behind. But we left Americans behind in Afghanistan. We left service members in a circumstance that is at a sitting ducks at Kabul airport, a situation they never should have been in. And we lost 13 of America's best that day. And as Afghanistan fell to the Taliban after decades of war, you know who watched? China watched, Russia watched, North Korea watched. Under President Trump, it was peace through strength, and under President Biden, it's violence through weakness. But we have a president who was asked, did you overpromise?" And he said, no, 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 I overperformed." And Jen Psaki told us this, I will never forget this line, my advice to everyone out there who is frustrated, sad, angry, pissed off, feel those emotions, go to a kickboxing class, have a margarita. Jen, I don't want a kickboxing class. I don't want a margarita. I want my country back. And here's the good news. We're going to get our country back. Le left-wing Quinnipiac, this is a left-wing polling outlet. If you believe Quinnipiac, you believe that Governor Ron DeSantis is not the governor of Florida right now. Uh, it's Andrew Gillum by 10 points. That's how left-wing they are. That was the polling the day before Governor DeSantis won the state of Florida. So if you believe this left-wing polling outlet, which is vastly skewed on behalf of Democrats, here's what they tell you. Joe Biden's approval rating on COVID-19, 39%. His approval rating on foreign policy, 35%. The economy, 34%. The U.S. border, 23%, and overall just 33% approving of Joe Biden. America has woken up. When you ask them <laughs> on personal issues, majorities of voters say that Biden is not energetic, he's not a strong leader, he's not a clear communicator, he doesn't keep his promises, he's not capable of leading the country, and 49% disagree that he's mentally fit. As my dad said, Joe Biden is a lost ball in tall grass. He is a lost ball. <laughs> my dad has great lines like that. <laughs> And America's not just waking up to the horrors of Joe Biden, they're waking up to the horrors and the malpractice of the American media. Edelman Trust Barometer, Axios publishes every January trust in media polling, and 67%, it's an extraordinary number, 67% believe this statement. Journalists are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know are false or grotesque. People have woken up to the media. Uh, we're, gonna, we're going to win in November, make no mistake about it. The issue is not, are we going to win, but how big are we going to win by? And thank goodness, because we're at a crossroads in this country. When our election integrity is at stake, when a law in Georgia is called, a voter integrity law is called Jim Crow 2.0 by President Biden. And he's fact-checked on it. Rare fact-checkers by the liberal media fact-check him and say not true. He doubles down and says, worse than Jim Crow, the greatest threat to democracy since the Civil War are these Georgia voting laws. Remember the MLB moved their all-star game. Well, as it turns out, voter turnout increased, early voting turnout by more than 100% in Georgia. So our elections are under attack. Our police officers, our valiant law enforcement are under attack. When I rode through the streets of D.C. amid those riots that occurred, and I see spray painted on the Veterans Affairs sign, A-C-A-B, all cops are, and I won't say that word. Uh, yesterday was the two-year marking of David Dorn, that amazing retired police officer just trying to protect his community. It's a two-year anniversary of that officer losing his life. Our police officers are under attack. Socialism is on the run. We have anti-Semitism in the halls of Congress. And most of all, at the crux of all of this, the most important issue, if you, vote, if you don't vote on any issue,
the issue that needs to be of paramount importance in your mind when you go to the polls as a Christian voter is the issue of life. Because I will tell you, I hope that opinion by Alito is going to become the law of the land in the Dobbs case. I hope that Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned. But make no mistake, Roe v. Wade is overturned. You cannot undo the horror of what has happened to our country. You can change it going forward, but we cannot fix what has already happened for decades, where 62 million babies have been exterminated because of abortion. That is one-fifth of the United States population exterminated because of abortion. Think about that. And the White House was asked, the press secretary was asked, Jen Psaki, is a baby a baby at 15 weeks? A baby at 15 weeks, though the baby has her, his or her eyes closed, can sense light. The baby has arms and legs that are moving. The baby has a heartbeat. And Jen Psaki would not say whether that baby at 15 weeks is a baby. Trust me. I've seen an ultrasound at earlier than 15 weeks, and tears come out of your eyes when you see it. That baby is a baby. And the 62 million lives lost are 62 million people whose potentials will never be realized. As Lawrence Tribe said, he's a far left legal commentator. Roe was a verbal smokescreen, the substantive judgment of which is nowhere to be found. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the late uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said it was heavy-handed judicial intervention that was difficult to justify. Uh, it's not a woman's right to choose. It is a baby's right to live. We're at a crossroads in this country on so many issues. Um, and when you look at our American flag, our beautiful American flag, this red, white, and blue we see here today, when even that is under attack, a New York Times editorial board member said they were disturbed to see American flags. Macy Gray called it tattered, divisive, incorrect. Uh, BLM Utah called the flag a symbol of hatred. U.S. Olympic Committee, apparently they're making plans to redesign it. Uh, and a, an alternate in the Olympics, an, an alternate said she dreamed of winning a medal so she could stand on the podium and not put that American flag around her shoulders, but burn it. That was her desire. We're at a crossroads in this country. And I will tell you this, the same way my dad and Van Jones said to me, you were made for such a time as this, um, I can tell you, each and every one of you, you're in this room, you're here for a reason. On a Friday night at after 9 p.m., listening to me and to the others this weekend for a reason, going through whatever you're going through, a hardship, a sickness, whatever it may be, for a reason. And God will use you. Um, this movement, what we're going through in this country, I can tell you there's one thing bigger than the problems and the ills that we face and the president um, that we have who's making some very bad decisions on a moral front, in my view. Uh, and the person who's in control, it's, it's him. He's up there. Thank you. And the same way my dad said to me, Kaylee, you were made for such a time as this. Make no mistake, all of you here, you were made for such a time as this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening.